Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Christensen, and I'm the Carol and Ed Kaplan Dean of the Armour College of Engineering at Illinois Tech. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Armour R&D Virtual Expo, showcasing the work of students who participated in the Armour R&D program during the spring 2021 semester. As I've come to appreciate, the Armour R&D Expo is a distinctive element of an engineering education at Illinois Tech giving undergraduate students the opportunity to gain hands-on research and development experience in the lab of a faculty mentor. Circumstances have been challenging over the past year plus, so I'm extremely proud of our students who persevered through it all, and I congratulate them for the wonderful work being highlighted today. I also offer my deepest appreciation to those faculty and graduate students who provided mentorship to these students. I hope you enjoy the excellence showcased in this Armour R&D Virtual Expo as much as I know I will. Hello everybody, my name is Asya and today I will be talking a little bit about my research in diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is caused because of diabetes and it is one of the leading causes of blindness in adults. Diabetic retinopathy doesn't show any early onset of symptoms, and if it is left untreated, it can lead to permanent loss of vision. Hence, the motivation behind this project is to identify uh, early preclinical signs and quantify biomarkers that can help in the early detection of this disease and help prevent permanent vision impairment for patients suffering from diabetic retinopathy. At present, fluorescence video angiography um, is the imaging modality or the gold standard test used to detect um, diabetic retinopathy. And present research indicates that biomarkers such as volumetric blood flow and retinal vascular permeability are the preclinical signs that are associated with diabetic retinopathy. However, the relationship between the volumetric blood flow, retinal vascular permeability, and the progression of diabetic retinopathy is largely unclear. And in addition to that, fluorescence video angiography takes about 10 minutes for data acquisition and cannot quantify these biomarkers, especially at the capillary level where diabetic retinopathy is extremely relevant. Hence, there's a need for improved detection methods of diabetic retinopathy with a better understanding of these um, early biomarkers or preclinical pre signs, which are volumetric blood flow and vascular permeability that can help us accurately identify or quantify this disease. So this project um, aims to apply the dynamic tracer kinetic model to measure the blood flow, the biomarker, and subsequently optimize the frame rate for the adaptation of this model to fluorescence video angiography data. We want to use the dynamic tracer kinetic model because this model has been widely researched and well established in studies related to brain hemodynamics, but hasn't been um, extremely popular in retinal applications because of the lack of imaging parameters that are yet to be <clears throat> determined or optimized. Hence, this project aims to um, identify the number of frames or the optimum frame rate that can is required to generate a high quality image while minimizing the error on the volumetric blood flow estimates after the application of this uh, tracer kinetic model. The theory behind this model is that if you treat a region of interest, on, uh, on the retinal image scan as a system of um, linear time invariant equations, then the response to the system can be characterized through a Dirac delta function or an impulse function, which can be used to isolate the volumetric blood flow. The volumetric blood flow hence becomes a function of the output imaging tracer concentration QT, uh, the arterial input function CAT, and the impulse residue function RT. This equation that you see here is what describes the um, QT or the imaging output tracer concentration, which is the convolution product of volumetric blood flow uh, with arterial input function to the impulse residue function. This can be used to um, identify the volumetric blood flow. The simplest model of RT is the plug flow model, which is just essentially a unit step function and this assumption can be made when there's negligible dispersion or leakage. Uh, the method then involves to assess the sensitivity of this model by, um, uh, by determining the estimates for volumetric blood flow in a simulation study that is carried out on noise-added model-based curves. Theoretical values of Q of T were calculated using equation one and random noise was added to it. The time range for each frame was, take, was simulated from one second to 100 seconds with intervals of 0 0.05 seconds and 20 frames were binned at a time. 
as the frames were binned, uh, the, the data for QT and CAT was generated and averaged. Then the boxcar model was applied to this um, generated values and was uh, fit for for QT and CAT. This process was repeated 100 times uh, with fresh random noise generation in MATLAB every time as the time were binned together. Here you can see the results on the right. You can see the boxcar model fit to the simulated QT curve. And this boxcar model was used to um, calculate the estimates for volumetric blood flow. And on the right, you see the variance bias and est uh, bias estimates of F at various bins that were framed. As you can see, the higher number of uh, bins provide much closer estimates to the actual value of the volumetric blood flow. Actual value of volumetric blood flow is um, 30 ml. And we saw that at um, 80 uh, frames that were binned together, um, at those uh, bins that were framed, uh, the estimate was closest to the actual value. The closed estimate was 33 ml with the standard deviation of 0 0.49 and mean squared error of 11.75. This is consistent with the theoretical um, assumptions that higher frame rates provide better quality images. And not only that, but uh, this higher frame rate enables us to see rapidly moving structures without motion artifacts and also um, allows us to perform um, velocity analysis at the capillary level where diabetic retinopathy is extremely relevant and occurring. Um, finally, there are first feature applications for this um, project. We want to investigate other imaging parameters such as force and dosage or motion correction through by applying this dynamic tracer kinetic modeling and uh, adapt it to the fluorescence video angiography data. Finally, quantifying hemodynamic parameters associated with pathological diseases can provide sensitive biomarkers that can help um, develop preventive therapies and distinguish patients that are healthy and patients that are likely to progress into diabetic retinopathy. Uh, finally, by reducing image data acquisition time, we can um, allow for rapid scans for patients and increasing the comfort and their safety uh, through fluorescence video angiography. Thank you so much for uh, listening. That's it from me. Uh, thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Jamie Griggs. I'm a third year co-terminal student majoring in civil and structural engineering. My research topic was an investigation on correlation between density and fatigue fracture prediction of human bone. So to first give a little background information on this topic, I will be talking about bone fatigue and bone density. In engineering materials, fatigue refers to the decrease of mechanical resistance and the accumulation of micro damage due to the cyclic application of a load that by itself is not sufficient to cause static failure. The same process occurs in human bone and can accumulate due to either an increase in damage rates, such as through an increase in physical activity, or a deficient repair within the skeletal system, such as caused by the deterioration of bone due to the aging process. Once accumulated, bone fatigue can lead to fatigue fracture, which results in a considerable recovery period for healthy bone and an increase in mortality rates for the elderly. Currently, there is not a standard practice method to screen for fatigue in bones prior to their failure due to the incidence being at nanometer to micrometer length scales over long periods of time and involving several compounding factors. The current methods used to detect micro damage, as shown in Figure 1, are invasive procedures that cannot be used safely on patients. Presently, the detection of fatigue fractures can only be diagnosed once they are developed enough to be detected using radiography, MRIs, or triple base bone scintigraphy. As for bone density, it refers to a measurement of the amount of minerals present within a segment of bone. Factors that can impact bone density include physical activity, age, and diet. For your diet, since bones are made up of minerals such as calcium and collagen, it is important to ingest sufficient amounts of such minerals to contribute to bone formation and remodeling. For physical activity, it stimulates biological remodeling in order to provide support to the increase in stress. Through the aging process, bone cells experience resorption at faster rate than production and therefore they lose density. Reliable human bone density measurements can be made by passing x-rays through a given bone and observing how much energy passes through. 
The absorption of this energy corresponds to the density of bones such that as bone density increases, the more mineral content is present within the bone to absorb energy. This idea is illustrated in figure two. Once bone density has been examined, it can be related to the general population using T-scores and Z-scores. T-scores compare the average peak bone mass by gender, whereas Z-scores compare it by age. Moving on to the correlation between bone fatigue and bone density and why it is important. So obtaining the correlation between bone density and bone fatigue life can lead to a more robust prediction of bone fatigue fracture initiation. This determination can eventually be used to predict susceptibility to fatigue fractures based on current density levels and therefore an appropriate prevention plan can be recommended. The main concept in which bone density relates to fatigue fracture in vivo involves a bone remodeling process, although due to limitations on research, it is unclear whether this process prevents or accelerates the fatigue of bone. An influential factor in solving this issue may be the rate at which the microdamage occurs. Biological remodeling may only be sufficient if microdamage is accumulated at a slow rate. This idea is illustrated in figure 3, which shows the bone remodeling process in relation to microdamage. Typically, the bone remodeling process can repair microdamage, although it could also be accelerated if the bone is continually stressed during remodeling when the bone is weak. Additionally, the introduction of on-site bone density raises the issue that an overall healthy bone mass measurement may not directly correlate to the susceptibility of fatigue fracture, and instead, a site-specific bone density measurement may provide a more accurate correlation. Current studies comparing bone fatigue and bone density have been limited to in vitro testing. One study concluded that the range of stresses and strains that bone tissue can tolerate in vivo without major damage is much smaller than has generally been assumed. It also found that only the total strain range impacted the fatigue life of bone, while the mean stress had an impact on the type of microdamage that accumulated. The data from this study was used to predict in vivo fatigue from various rigorous activities, as highlighted in Figure 4. Another study generated a specimen residual value to directly examine the effects of density on bone fatigue life. It was found that a 6% increase in bone density resulted in a threefold increase in bone fatigue life. Other studies have results involving the impact of density, yet no previous correlations between fatigue life and density have been shown. Therefore, in order to gain a better understanding of the correlation between bone density and fatigue life, additional research must be made. Hey guys, my name is Ryan Haroon. I'm a freshman biomedical engineering major, and this past semester I had a pure project. It was called Simulating the Effect of ble Bleeding on the Quality of Fluorescence Guided Surgery Images. Uh, just to summarize the project a little bit, the main objective was to compare and contrast surgical images of cancerous tissues in a vitro environment. Uh, for the final result, we had two images, one with blood covering the surface of the tissue and one without. Uh, basically, we measured the quality of fluorescence that came back up through the blood to appear on the actual surgery images. Um, so how we actually did that, we used a software called MC MATLAB and we basically edited the properties of it to resemble real tissue and real fully oxygenated blood. And we also put in the IR800 dye optical properties so basically the first step was to calculate and research all of those uh, through articles and all that stuff, through scholarly stuff. And then after that, we input that into the actual code. We built the soft, we built the simulation. So basically there was a layer of blood over the su surface and we put the optical properties of the tissue, the blood, and the IR800 dye to resemble the actual real stuff. <clears throat> And so after those were calculated and put in, uh, we started ed editing the actual tissue size and where it was placed. So the tissue was placed for the first, first, um, the first image, it was placed one millimeter below the surface and it was changed into a spherical shape. And so what we did was we measured, we ran eight simulations total and they were all different based upon their where the tissue was placed, whether it had blood or not, and the open whether it was an open or closed aperture. So the first experiment was open aperture 
one millimeter deep. One mil the tissue was one millimeter below the surface and it had no blood. The second one was closed, one millimeter deep with no blood. Third was one was one millimeter deep, open aperture with blood. Fourth was closed aperture, one millimeter deep with blood. The fifth one, we basically did the five through eight, we basically did the same as one through four, but 3.5 millimeters deep below the surface. And so with those, we had the basic images of, we could see the cancer and how, how it was affected through the blood. So just from, based off just those images, we could tell that the images with blood were kind of obscure and it was, it wasn't as good. The quality wasn't as well, not as much fluorescent was appearing as we wanted. So after that, we, to put it, the actual experiment required us to compare it in a RADFI image. And so we, basically we took the ratio between the open and closed apertures. We divided the, the open aperture by the closed aperture and we got the actual RADFI images with that. And so basically after doing that, we could compare the two images better in, a, in the actual RADFI technology. And we found that the blood actually made it negligible to compare it to without blood. So our initial hypothesis was correct and that the excess blood enveloping the surface in a vitro tumor at clinical levels, the RADFI surgery images will not be drastically affected. And so I believe that that concludes most of it. Um, the reason why we believe that, <clears throat> the reason why we believe that initially without ratioing the images first that, I mean, it was expected that it would be a, more obscure with the blood just because the blood had a higher op, had a higher absorption coefficient and scattering efficient added on top. So we basically expected those photons to, you know, not, not appear as, as much as it would without the fluorescence. Um, so that basically sums it up. Our, our Hello, my name is Xiong Yun Hua, and I did a research about auditive manufacturing of Thai 64 under Professor Amir Mustafai. The object of the research was to understand fundamental concepts of auditive manufacturing related to material science. Laser powder bath fusion is auditive manufacturing technique to fabricate parts. It makes certain thickness of powder on a surface with a roller or blade. Then the laser source melts the powder particles based on a CAD model that we design. For this research, cuboid shape was used to make small coupons. Thai 64 is a high strength alloy with a binary alpha beta microstructure. It has high corrosion re resistance and strength with low density so that it can be used in marine, chemical, and aerospace industry. Also, this alloy can be heat treated and this means that microstructure can be changed in order to improve properties. And Thai 64 has good biocompatibility. Compared to stainless steel, which can be also used in human body, titanium can give same strength with lightweight alloy. Additive manufacturing for Thai 64 has been studied for a long time because it is a very famous alloy for structural, biomedicine industry, and etc. Majority of the studies are about the spherical powders because they can flow and compact better. However, they are expensive. So in this research, irregular shaped powders were fabricated with hydrate-dehydrate method. This is a chemical method that can produce hydrate titanium. The picture in the middle are morphology of powders with an irregular shape that we used. We had a combination of fine and slightly coarse powders and EOS M290 machine was used as on a 3D printer. This is a laser powder bad fusion machine. 
We have different combinations of laser and scan speed to make coupons. To replicate the experiment, we printed at least two samples for each power velocity combination. In order to study how does the porosity can be affected by post processing, such as hot isotactic pressing, we hipped the print part, printed part to see how we can close porosity to improve strength and bulk density. HIP is a method to apply a uniform pressure at high temperature to close residual pores. Data analysis was conducted to get more information of cross-section area of samples. There are two sets of process map data of as-built parts. These show that after HIP treatment, majority of fraction of porosity has been decreased. On the right, there are optical images of cross-section parts in order to investigate the fraction of porosity and bulk parts. Upper part of images are as-built parts with different porosities. There are, there are irregular shape and spherical shape pores. Irregular shape pores are related to lack of fusion because of low power and high scan speed. And the spherical pores are related to keyhole mode printing, which happens when there is unstable printing condition. They are also related to vapor gas forming in depth that could not escape to the top surface and remain inside after solidification. We can see the heat process closed spherical pores. In conclusion, with cost-effective powder used in laser powder bed fusion machine, we showed that we can get parts with over 99.8% of density as an as-built part. And after doing hip treatment, we could close majority of pores and get nearly fully dense parts. I would like to acknowledge to graduate students who helped me to collect and analyze data and also mentored me. Also, I acknowledge for financial support from a more R&D program and Carnegie Mellon University for printing samples for us. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Pukita Jain and I'm a third year chemical engineering student. This semester I participated in Armour Research and Development Pure program and worked with Dr. Madassa Rashid, who is a professor in the chemical and biological engineering department. The topic of our research is predictive modeling for early hyperglycemia detection in type 2 diabetes. The overall objective is to be able to develop a decision support system for people dealing with type 2 diabetes. The research objective for us was to be able to develop a mathematical model of blood glucose concentrations, which will enable us to predict future glucose values. I will begin by first introducing the topic and talking a bit about type 2 diabetes. As we all know, eating leads to an increase in blood sugar levels. Pancreas release insulin, which helps adipose cells to absorb the glucose in our blood, thus lowering the blood glucose level. Essentially, this is how our body regulates glucose levels. With type 2 diabetes, however, our body either starts producing less insulin or it starts to resist the insulin produced. Someone with type 2 diabetes can have either or conditions or even a mix of two. The graph here shows blood glucose data from three patients and also the threshold limit. The green line is the threshold limit. We can see that their blood glucose goes above the threshold multiple times, which can lead to health problems. Now, in a situation like this, the responsibility to manage the blood glucose lies entirely on the patient. They do so by using the continuous glucose monitoring sensor um, this sensor monitors the blood glucose concentration every five minutes. So a novel idea is to be able to use this continuous blood glucose concentration data and perhaps make predictions which would enable us to detect hyperglycemia early. This is essentially what the aim of the research is. For the methods in our research, we collected blood glucose data from 135 patients 
prepared it and processed it and then fit a mathematical model to it. The mathematical model chosen was partial least squares regression. PLS re relates regressor and regressed variables by maximizing the covariances between them. PLS builds linear relations between input data and output data and uses these relations to predict future values. PLS has latent variables that describe the important underlying features of the data. First, we created a glucose act matrix and then split the data as 80% training and 20% testing. Then we normalized our data by obtaining the z-scores of it. We did this to ensure that the PLS model fits as well as possible. Then we performed the PLS regression on our training data and found the predicted values. We also tested how well the PLS model fits by using it on our testing data and obtaining the mean square errors for both training and testing. We made future predictions about the blood glucose concentrations, calculated the prediction accuracy by obtaining mean square errors, and also tweaked some model parameters of latent variables and past horizons to optimize the performance of the model. Latent variables are crucial to the PLS model and help find better relations to perform regression. Past horizons are the set of previous data points that are needed by the program to determine accurate prediction values. Now, this image right here shows the graphs we obtained when we tested our model with the optimal parameters. The top one is the one with training data and the bottom one is for testing data. The red is the model fit. Um, and as we can see, the model fits the data quite well. This next image here um, shows how we optimize the latent variable parameters. This figure demonstrates the error associated with the different parameters. The number of variables used was selected based on the number of flags values used and the lowest error value. In the next image here, we depict the testing data with the optimal parameters, but for different prediction horizons. The first one is for a 15 minute ahead prediction and it fits perfectly. The next one is for 30 minutes ahead. The further you look into the future, the more uncertain it gets. So as the prediction horizon increases, we have a higher error, but that's a trade-off we were willing to make. Now, in conclusion, we fit a mathematical model of the PLS regression to the blood glucose concentration data obtained from the continuous glucose monitoring sensor and then made future predictions for it. We also analyzed these predictions to obtain optimal parameters. Future work right here would entail using these parameters and predictions to develop a decision support system in the form of an alarm, which will help people with type 2 diabetes manage their blood glucose and to be able to detect hyperglycemia early and take necessary precautions for their health. A special thanks to Armour College of Engineering and Dr. Rashid for extending this opportunity to me. Also, thank you all for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to my project presentation of the development of novel vacuum frozen method to image organon chips. My name is Advait Anil Joshi, and today I'll be explaining to you about my project. So, um, organon chips play an important role to effectively model the behavior and interactions of human cells. They offer a cost alternative to in vivo or conventional in vitro modeling, in addition to the ability to apply dynamic flow in the chambers and continually replenish the cells with nutrients while taking away waste. Collagen is an important element in the intestine. Dr. Bhushan's lab, in which I've been working and been conducting this research, has already developed a membrane that can be used to separate the two chambers inside of microfluidic devices. However, there are a few difficulties associated with both the traditional transvol membrane, which is used in normal cases uh, and is made from polyester, and the collagen membrane, which I am using um, in my project. The material itself that makes up the um, devices and the fabrication process makes it difficult to obtain clear pictures of the inside of the chambers. To combat these difficulties, this project focuses on creating a method to essentially cut the device into very thin slices, approximately 100 micrometers in thickness. This method will allow us to obtain a side view of the chambers, allowing us to take clearer pictures of the inside of the chambers. Let's talk about the methods. CACO2 intestinal cells were cultured inside 
two kinds of microfluidic devices. The first kind had only the transal membrane and the second kind had only the collagen membrane separating the two chambers of the device. The chambers were flooded with optimal cutting temperature or OCT compound by first submerging the devices in it and then placing them in vacuum overnight. It was found that OCT helps preserve the shape of the membrane and keeps the cells in place. The vacuum method was used because it is difficult to introduce OCT into the chambers due to the chambers um, being very thin and due to the OCT's high viscosity. This method has not been done by researchers before. After the night in the vacuum, the devices were frozen at minus 20 degrees Celsius overnight in preparation of the cryostat procedure. All devices were sectioned into slices approximately 100 micrometers in thickness using the cryostat microtome. Immunostaining was then carried out on the resulting slices. Phalloidin was used to stain the F-actin protein in the cells, while Hulk, sorry, this is difficult to pronounce, while Hoxt was used to stain the cell nuclei. Now let's look at the figures in the middle of the poster. Figure two shows the sex sectioned microfluidic devices with no cells. This step was done to make sure that the membrane survived the shear stresses of the sectioning procedure. And as can be seen, this holds true since both the collagen membrane on the left and the transval membrane on the right have held their positions. Figures 3a and b show the cell growth of the collagen transval membranes respectively. The blue stains show the presence of cell nuclei. Notice how the cells have grown inside the collagen membrane too in figure 3a, indicating that they have formed a 3D structure along the collagen fibers. In addition, notice how the cells spontaneously form the villi structure on the straight transal membrane in figure 3b. Now let's look at figure 4. Figure 4a and b also show the cell growth on collagen and transal membranes respectively, but this time they are also stained with phalloidin to show the presence of F-actin, which is present in the cells. Here too, in figure 4b, we can see the villi structure. It was found that the villi height was considerably higher on the collagen membrane than on the transal membrane, about two times as high as shown in figure 5. In conclusion, the project was successful in developing a novel method to section microfluidic devices. The membranes held their shape, and we saw that the growth of cells is indeed better on collagen membrane than on a traditional transal membrane. The specific method developed in this project is completely new and has been created specifically for device development in Dr. Bhushan's lab. In the future, I hope to use this developed method to investigate the features of co-cultured intestinal cells and gut bacteria. For this research, I'd like to thank the Armour College of Engineering Undergraduate Research Program and the NSF for their support to make this project a success. I'd like to th thank Dr. Chengya Wang and Dr. Abhinav Bhushan for their help. In addition, I'd like to thank Dr. Kenneth Tishauer for the use of his lab's cryostat microtome and Cynthia Lee and Cody Rounds for training and troubleshooting of the microtome. Thank you so much and hope you have a good day. This is my video for the Armour R&D Expo. My project is on novel method development for inhibiting pathogenic biofilms using engineered beneficial microbes. My name is Yashwan, and my advisors on this project are Sungjun An, a master's student at my lab, and Professor Hong, who is the principal investigator at my lab. First up is the background. A biofilm comprises any syntrophic consortium of microorganisms in which cells stick to each other and often all to a surface. These cells become embedded with a slimy extracellular matrix that offers it a lot of resistance to exogenous stresses like drugs. And biofilms have been found to be involved in a wide variety of microbial infections in the body. This poses a problem as these biofilms get formed on medical devices like catheters, which is
is the main problem we're tackling in our project. As shown here, as the infections are usually asymptomatic and because of the danger of promoting antibiotic resistance, the catheter-associated bacteria is generally not, generally not addressable. So our strategy is to form an even layer of probiotic microbes as these probiotic microbes are beneficial in inhibiting the pathogenic biofilms. Our main focus in the study is to form an even distribution of microbes in our biofilm. So we're trying to go from an uneven distribution to an even distribution. Our strategy is to target the surface proteins and use uh, non-standard amino acid incorporation to inject the surface proteins with the properties that we want and have a surface coated with our B molecule and have these two components interact to form a uniform film on a layer. Our first strategy is to identify genes coding surface proteins of our model organism E. coli and use the, sur uh, use the outer membrane proteins OMPX and OMPW. We are then going to incorporate PAZ, which is a non-standard amino acid, into the desired gene. This is the plasmid map of PEVOL PAZF, the primary NSAA we're using in the study. This is our cloning procedure for the project. We use a vector PGL1 SFGFP, where SFGFP is our green fluorescent protein. We do a restriction process on it to remove the SFGFP, which is green fluorescent protein, and ligate it, where we insert our desired OMPX and OMPW gene and transform it. We first amplified OMPX P119X with the, uh, with the condition given on the slide here. This was a successful project as seen in the gel picture shown. We then restricted the vector PJL1 SFGFP to remove SFGFP from the vector. We then ligated and transformed it and we obtained the required plasmids. Next up is the CFPS procedure, which is cell-free protein synthesis, where we induced orthogonal AARS or orthogonal tRNA pairs to functionalize the NSA incorporation. As we can see, in our second case, CFPS with 100 micromolar concentration shows a, uh, an efficiency of 62%. We then use click chemistry, a technology which is used to label biomarkers to measure the efficacy of our procedure. From our first incubation, we were uh, able to observe that the labeling was strong enough in OMPXS, OMPXP, OMPW, and OMPWA, whereas OMPWD does not show any labeling effect, possibly indicating that the NSA incorporation in this case has not worked. Here, we can confirm that OMPX S77X, OMPX P119X, and OMPW A90X have been proved for good efficiency, but not for OMPW D137X. We do this by comparing it to the original BL21 plasmid. Our future work is going to be to perform double or triple mutant NSAA incorporation and observe the surface distribution. Thank you. Hello, I'm Hyungjun Kim, majoring, I'm senior in major and majoring mechanical engineering. So my research topic for armor um, R and D program is integrity and in integrity requirements for autonomous vehicles in urban area. So, in this research, I try to 
I tried to analyze um, setting up the integrity level for a ground autonomous, autonomous vehicles, and as well as the alert limits for for um, for the autonomous vehicles <clears throat> in Chicago. So I did. The, I, I I followed the steps of ver verifications on a paper and the paper uh, of localization requirements for autonomous vehicles by Tyler Reed. And I ver I verified each step and and relate um, this paper into our research. So in his paper um, uh, regarding integrity risk allocation processes, uh, he first set the target level of safety of ground vehicles, and then also um, the, the ratio of fatal crashes per failure. And then um, he used um, this target level of safety to get the uh, integrated risks for, um, for localization, uh, which is included in the virtual driver system. So um, he basically followed the method of assign um, assign a specific number, a specific integrity risk to the system level and verified um, with historical data of, of both uh, ground vehicles and a aviation vehicle, aviation side. And regarding alert limits, um, he verified um, horizontal and vertical uh, requirements as well as the uh, alignment. But um, in our research, um, only horizontal requirements are needed. So the goal, goal of setting alert limits is, uh, is to keep the car on the right track. And alert limit depends on the car dimensions and, and the road geometry. So um, we can um, get the relationship between uh, longitudinal and lateral alert limits um, in the curved, curved road case. And then um, we can generate the plot of uh, both alert limits, and we can um, pick pick one of the the param parameters um, with that result. And in our research, the the State Street, um, the, the 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 dimension of State Street was was used, and. And also, um, we found that the, the accidents are more frequently happened in, in intersections rather than along the blocks. So um, we took an approach um, dividing the integrity risks into uh, whether it's on the block or it's on the intersection. And, and, and by doing that, we can divide the integrity risk into different situations. And also um, we, um, my future works will be um, analyzing vehicle dynamic model, uh, which is known as the bicycle, bicycle model uh, to relate the time to, time to alert into the frequency response of the vehicle model. So, so time to alert, uh, time to alert is the period of time that um, the, the alert limit um, exceeds the protection level. So the input, the acceleration and, uh, and the steering angle of this uh, bicycle model and input is the inputs are acceleration and steering angle of um, angle. And we can do the frequency, frequency analysis of this bi bicycle model and relate this into the time to alert. So that's a pretty much of it, of uh, my research. And thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Elias Cluzo and I am presenting my work in Dr. Tischauer's lab for the spring 2021 uh, Armor R&D, pure R&D program um, with the theme in biomedical research of health. 
Um, so for this project, uh, I worked on improving murine window chamber implantation um, for with the overall goal of subdermal fluorescent imaging of the mice's tissue. Uh, and I work with Dr. Tischauer um, on this project and serve so he was a mentor for this, um, as, well as, as well as with Cody Rounds, which is one of Dr. Tischauer's PhD students. Um, and I was picking up a project that they were working on, um, and uh, which I'll discuss later, the overall project. But just to get started, I am screen recording this, um, and I'll be using the Zoom key to zoom in and out to sort of uh, show different areas of the um, poster and sort of like I'm pointing to it as if I was presenting it in real life. So let's go with the introduction. So uh, window trimmer models are this new tool in uh, the imaging of in vitro models in mice. Um, I'm sorry, in vivo models in mice. Um, and they're basically, they're kind of as simple as they sound, where it's just as basically you insert um, a, a chamber with a piece of glass over it, um, and you surgically implant it into a mouse in lieu of skin. Um, and by that way, you can sort of look through the glass and see into the mice's organs. Um, and it's sort of sutured in there. So it's a semi-permanent part of the mice and it can kind of, you know, it's really great for, you know, you put some sort of treatment under the glass, affecting the organs underneath the glass. And over a period of time, you know, so several weeks, you can view the thing under the glass, um, whatever treatment you're using, to sort of see it progress, right? Normally, if you use like an imaging device to sort of, you know, uh, you know, if you, if you want to use a radioisotope and do some kind of MRI on the mouse, that's not really something that we could image over a period of weeks. Like I, I wouldn't be able to just check in and look through glass and see how it's progressing, right? So it's kind of having that kind of quick and easy access to see how a treatment's progressing within the mouse is, is, has been really beneficial in this type of research for pharmacokinetics, long-term treatments, that kind of stuff. Um, for this specific project, we were looking at a treatment involved with shifting uh, adipocyte uh, behavior from lipid storing, which is uh, called white adipocytes, and lipid burning, which are brown or beige adipocytes. Uh, adipocytes are basically cells that store fat, so they're kind of like your fat cells. And white fat is what we kind of see on the outside. They're kind of um, very heavy storage molecules. And brown fats are um, sort of closer to the muscles, and they're more set up to burn through um, sort of like medium-term storage, I guess you could say, whereas white lipid cells are a long-term storage. So the idea of this product is to reduce the effects of obesity um, by genetically modified by applying a, a device to deliver nanoparticles that would deliver RNA to change the expression of these of the white lipocytes, um, so the white adipocytes to brown adipocytes, so that they would be able to be burned easier, get rid of more fat, reduce obesity, and that kind of stuff. Um, in patients who have um, diabetes or obesity and that kind of thing, make it easier to sort of get rid of that extra weight. Um, and the idea was to have this window tumor on a mouse that put the put the window tumor over the the fat pads of these mice and to apply this genetic um, engineering technique and to see how it affects the composition of the fat pad on the mouse. Um, so Dr. Papa Vasilius and Dr. Vasek's lab had, uh, are, are working on the lipid burning um, nanoparticles, or I'm sorry, the, the sRNA delivering nanoparticles, and we're working on the imaging system and the mouse, the mice um, procedure to sort of uh, verify that the, that the nanoparticles are working. So it's kind of a joint project with the two groups. Um, and so my project specifically was on how to implant, implement the, um, I'm sorry, implant the window chamber in the mouse um, and to try to track the, and sort of to see how long the, the window chamber would last, what kind of methods would be best, what can increase the lifespan of the mouse um, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and in this diagram here, we can see some different types of my, mouse window chambers. Um, the two on the top, the one in diagram A is a cranial window chamber and the one diagram B is a skin fold window chamber and the diagram C and B are most similar to um, the fat pad diagrams that we're going to be, or the fat pad uh, window chambers that I was planning on implementing. Um, so if you want if you want the, the diagram idea, it would be C and D, would be most similar. Um, but yeah, it's on the dorsal side. It's kind of like number C, but it's on the dorsal side of the mouse. So it's on the back over a fat pad over the liver. Uh, but we'll get that into that in a little bit. Um, so going on to the method section. So to implant the window chamber, um, I have basically have to anesthetize the, the mouse by a um, inhalation of isoflurane and oxygen, um, and it kind of uh, it passes out. It's completely anesthetized, so it doesn't feel anything during the surgery. Um, I then go through some sterilizing procedures, such as um, coating it in uh, iodine as a sanitizing solution. Um, you know, I, I, I sanitize all my instruments in uh, the autoclave, and I put them all in ethanol while I'm doing the surgery. 
Um, and then, so the first surgical step is injecting the mouse with uh, a lidocaine epinephrine mixture to reduce bleeding and reduce soreness overall. Um, and then I start the, start the procedure by removing the skin um, that I, I marked up previously with a marker and the window chamber to sort of, you know, remove, I always remove less skin than I need to to make sure I, I don't cut off more than is needed. And I insert the chamber by suturing. Um, and yeah, and that's that's that kind of. There is, the suturing procedure works in two ways. Um, there's a, a ring that goes inside the skin and then one that's on top and they're kind of sewed together so it's kind of, it sandwiches the skin in between the two uh, parts of the chamber. And there are mul multiple methods that we work with on um, doing that process of retaining the bottom ring. So with the bottom ring, we started by, uh, as you can see in this image right here on the bottom of the two circular images, um, you see that there's all those holes. We originally started with the, with the bottom retaining ring of inserting, of going through each of those holes um, and then putting the one on top of each of those holes as well, but it just ended up being too much suturing. So we ended up for the bottom retaining ring of the device, we would put, um, light sutures that could be removed easily afterwards. So it just reduced the amount of time that the surgery was going on to re reduce the um, stress on the mouse, right? Um, and again, there's to sort of explain it with pictures better. We have this diagram here, which is the bottom ring of the window chamber and this one, which is the top ring of the window chamber. So we have, this goes underneath the skin and this goes over over that ring with the skin sandwiched between. Um, and the glass goes right in the middle here. Um, after the, the chamber is implanted by suturing, um, we, uh, use, we put it under uh, anesthesia again, um, we place it in, uh, you know, we do a lateral tail in that injection into with a, a fluorescent mixture so that the blood of the mouth is lit up with this uh, fluorescent marker, and then we image it to kind of see, you know, uh, and we take a picture through MATLAB to see how the vasculature is looking through the window chair, how, how clear is that, how well can we image something underneath it. Um, and you can kind of see in these results here on the left, you see um, a mouse who was just who has it's been a day or two after surgery. They still have the window chamber here. Um, they're functioning. They thrive properly. They they live comfortable comfortably with the window chamber on. They're not their living ability is restricted at all. Um, and then on the right we see some images taken in MATLAB with the fluorescent. Um, these images were not imaged with the tail injection occurring. These are um, with a, a subdermal injection of the fluorescent. So uh, the dark space is actually the the um, the vein, the vasculature as opposed to um, with, a t with a tail injection picture, we'll see um, the veins lit up and the background dark. Um, so the plan is to use multiple dyes on this mouse. And so we actually built, in, 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 a, in addition to this project, we, we had a camera built with Dr. Tushauer and Cody Rounds um, to sort of image this for us and stuff. Um, and so the, the imaging system is multi-channel, so we can image multiple different fluorescent dyes. Um, such as, uh, again, different types of fluorescent and also uh, a, a cyan dye. Um, and we have to mess with these images to make them look better and to increase contrast and everything like that. Um, but it was able to show that we could image fluorescent uh, biomarkers or, or just fluorescent markers through um, the window chamber, and it was able to stay within the mouse um, for a reasonable period of time for for longer studies, right? Um, so the conclusion is, um, <clears throat> from routine testing, we've kind of figured out that the nine holes, uh, we, we messed around with different types of, of sizing for, uh, and different hole types and different sizes of the window chamber, uh, with this top one um, being the one we eventually went with. Um, this bottom one was what we started out with, and there's too many holes, and it was too large to be viable for a longer period of time. Um, so we have, with this top one, we have less holes so that we can fill each one and have them be good sutures as opposed to, um, you know, every other one and that kind of thing. Having a good solid suture for each of these holes is good nice. And also it being smaller still allows proper imaging of the fat pads, um, but it also, you know, it doesn't, it's having it smaller is less stress on the mice's body, right? Um, so kind of messing around, we determined that this top one here, which is, uh, let's see, it's six millimeters in diameter. Uh, as you can see down here, it's gonna be nine holes, six millimeters in diameter. And uh, the edge was also modified between these two designs here. So the edge was chamfered slightly so it could fit under the skin better. Um, but that was the, the, the design we with. That was the best that we could do with the system. Um, and we were able to get, like I said, these, these results we have over here with the mouse living and the fluorescence over here. Um, however, for future experiments, we we're thinking about implementing uh, and 3D printing a system that looks like this, where there is no suturing um, and the skin is just kind of a small hole is created and this window chamber is inserted around the skin and the skin is, is meant to grow around it. So it becomes much more permanent and less invasive due to the sutures. Um, because when we fill 
this chamber here um, with uh, saline to sort of get it so it's uh, optically viable, um, some leaks out through the holes that were meant that were sutured together, right? Regardless of how well the sutures are. So this one is intended to be more um, tight to the mouse's body, um, less leakage and everything like that, while still um, being slightly easier to implement and able to view through. So um, the conclusion here that we have is that having less sutures and changing the the suturing method, like I mentioned before, with um, not putting as many sutures in and having them temporary, um, that's the best method, as well as this sort of chamfered edge with the with the uh, nine hole design. Um, that's the best method we could come up using suturing and using traditional methods, um, but it still sort of resulted in some issues with mouse morality, I'm sorry, mouse mortality, um, and that kind of thing. So we're looking at changing this in the, in the long run. Uh, but again, our conclusion, we experimented with a little bit with this process and we came up with this um, window chamber um, protocol um, that really helps for uh, the beginnings of this project. Um, so yeah, that's my research here. Um, Going for future research into the summer, we're hoping to sort of work out this, um, experiment with this type of, of window chamber design to see if that's any better. So get rid of the issues entirely of mouse mortality and leakages and all that kind of stuff um, before right now this is uh, what I have to present. Um, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed listening and I hope it makes sense to you guys. Um, and thanks so much. Have a nice one.